So Gene, I see the time is now one o'clock. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, by the way, of introduction, this is Gene Hatch. He is one of our meteorologists with the National Weather Service in Springfield. And quite honestly, he is the guy that I turn to when it comes to the, uh, uh, the, the climate of the Ozarks. He has been our climate focal point since 1999. So you're in very good hands. Gene Hatch. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I want to thank you all for for uh, taking the time out uh, to spend a little time with us and talk about uh, drought, woolly worms, and La Nina. Um, again, uh, as Steve mentioned, my name is Gene Hatch. I'm a meteorologist and, and the climate focal point here. Um, and today we're just gonna kind of, uh, well, let me get the right screen here. Uh, we'll, we'll go through and, and we'll discuss, um, you know, parts of what we're seeing across the area as far as uh, the current drought conditions. Um, uh, we really saw the, the, the rain kind of stop here, uh, oh, uh, mid late, um, you know, June or so. Uh, we'll kind of take a look at where we are now, uh, some of the factors that got us to where we are as far as the dry conditions. Um, and, and then also take a look a little bit at, uh, you know, some of the circulations uh, that could potentially be responsible for this or have some impacts on the weather that we see across the area. So one thing to note, I wanted to make sure, you know, if you have any additional questions uh, towards the end uh, or after this is over with, there's multiple ways uh, for you to get hold of us uh, to, to ask those questions. Um, in addition with our social media accounts, uh, you can also uh, ask questions there, uh, or uh, we'll do posts uh, on this information uh, quite often. So uh, there's several ways for you to uh, get this information other than just through this uh, uh, webinar. So uh, we'll, first off, we'll kind of look back at uh, how did we get where we are now, uh, kind of taking a look back um, at, oh, uh, the last year uh, through today, really. Um, you know, it's really been a tale of two halves as we've gone through the year. You know, to date, um, we've we've had a decent amount of rainfall. Uh, just looking, um, you know, as far as uh, for for the year so far, we've actually had 41, a little over 41 inches of rain as we go through the year from January 1st. Uh, and, you know, that's really kind of uh, above uh, where we should normally be this time of year uh, to, to almost six, six inches above where we should be. But you can definitely see uh, where our rain uh, really, really cut off. Uh, through June 11th, we had had, you know, almost 35 and a half inches of rain. Um, and since then, five, and you know, about five and a half inches of rain. So, um, you know, really saw, uh, you know, that tail of two halves uh, as we have gone through the year so far. Um, but what uh, what is the, uh, has been kind of the cause of that? Um, well, um, again, we kind of had that tail of two halves as far as uh, the weather patterns across the area. Um, you know, for the beginning of the year, really through May, um, we saw a lot more of uh, what we call Southwest flow patterns. They were much more common. Um, you know, with those type of patterns, uh, the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico can make it up into the Ozarks a, a lot easier. Um, yeah, the quality of that moisture um, is, is much greater as we get into the area. Um, in addition, uh, we, we oop, uh, there we go. Technical issues. Me pressing the wrong buttons. Um, as we went through the year, uh, to begin the year, we started the year in El Nino uh, conditions. And we'll talk a little bit more about El Nino and, and La Nina here uh, a little bit later. Um, but we did transition as we got into uh, you know, early, early spring and through the summer into what's considered neutral conditions, or some folks like to affectionately call it La Nada. Um, and as we did transition, uh, we saw more northwesterly flow pattern in, in our weather pattern become more common. Um, you know, 
And in general, what happens with that is we get more of a, a ridging over the uh, the Rockies. Um, what that does is it really shunts the the better Gulf moisture, uh, you know, a little bit north and east of our area. Uh, that's not to say that in any of these patterns, um, you know, that we couldn't continue to see that this ridge flatten or get southwesterly flow uh, during these. It's just has been the more common pattern uh, that uh, that northwesterly flow uh, really from from June through September. And in that time frame, we also transitioned to a La Nina as well. Um, Looking back at the, the last uh, 30, 60, and 90 day rainfall amounts, um, it, it's it's been pretty dry. Um, and I'm sure everybody is aware of that at this point. Uh, you know, you start looking at the last 30 days and, and we see areas over here in Lawrence, uh, Newton, and Barton counties um, that are in less than 10% of the, uh, the 30 day average rainfall. Um, you know, and with the exception of very few areas, most locations are, uh, you know, fairly dry. Uh, that is uh, played out as well in the 60-day rainfall amounts, uh, where we see areas uh, across southwest Missouri that are, uh, you know, below 25% of normal for the 60-day period. And then we start looking at the 90-day the period, where we're going back almost three months at this point. And quite a bit of the area um, is currently, you know, at 50% uh, of their 90-day uh, rainfalls, uh, and a lot of that is the reason why we are currently in uh, severe drought across a portion of uh, Southwest Missouri. Um, those 30, 60, and 90-day rainfall totals, those amounts, um, are, are one of the things that that we provide uh, to the state climatologist uh, in making recommendations to the U.S. Drought Monitor. Uh, we work fairly closely with uh, the other offices across Missouri uh, and, uh, you know, air in uh, southeast Kansas as well. Uh, those offices, we work with uh, the Kansas uh, Weather Service offices and the state climatologists out there in providing recommendations as well. Uh, but a lot of that information goes into that. It's not only the 30, 60, and 90 day amounts, uh, but also we look at uh, soil moistures, uh, stream flow and lake levels, agricultural impacts, surface water levels. All of this information is provided um, as part of those recommendations. Um, and the U.S. Drought Monitor, um, in case you want to take a look at that, there's a lot of information, more than what I'm going to show here today, is available at their website. Something else as well is not only do we provide recommendations, um, but you can actually provide recommendations directly to uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor authors by submitting a report at the, uh, the Drought Reporter as well. And there's a URL, that, a URL there as well. So uh, understanding where we are now, you know, it's pretty dry at, at this point. Um, but uh, where could we be going? And I underline could because we're going to take a look at uh, climatology um, as we go forward. Uh, one of the things, like I said, I mentioned, we are moving into a La Nina at this point. Um, generally, uh, the area or ENSO, the ENSO area, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Area, uh, that they, they're talking about when they're talking about El Ninos or La Ninas is really this area of the equatorial Pacific. Uh, in the left-hand uh, screen you'll, or image there, you, you'll see a top-down view of the temperatures across equatorial Pacific. Um, and you can see this, this broad area of cooler than normal waters, uh, which is the indication of La Nina at this point. Uh, on the right-hand side, you're looking at a cross-section view as if you're looking um, into the water. Um, and you can see how deep that cold water is uh, across that area. And, that, and that's really what they're, when they're looking at those La Ninas and when they determine that we're in a La Nina or an El Nino, um, that, that's uh, those areas that they're really looking at. And, and at this point, we are in uh, a, a La Nina as we go into uh, 
the end of fall or fall and through this winter. Um, now, when I said we were going to look at climatology, I wanted you to understand uh, where La Nina is measured from to get an idea uh, before we started talking about climatology. But what you're looking at here is actually a plot of uh, 22 uh, La Nina years that have occurred. Now, ENSO has been measured since 1950, which is, a, is 70 years worth uh, of data. Um, so what we're looking at here is, is the plot of 22 of those actual years where we had La Nina conditions during the winter. Um, you can see on this plot that the average uh, conditions in those 22 winter years, because so we're looking at the, uh, the November to March timeframe is what we're measuring here, um, that there over that timeframe, those 22 years, uh, we've tended to be slightly drier um, during La Nina winters. Now, La Nina can be broken down in, into several different uh, strengths, weak, moderate, strong, or very strong. Uh, currently, we're expecting potentially to be in a, in a weak La Nina. Um, now, when we start looking at temperatures, um, there's really not a whole lot of skill uh, in, in, in what we've seen in the past. Um, you know, looking at those, those 22 winters, it really didn't lean far away from, uh, you know, near normal conditions at this point. Um, so if we actually start looking at just the, the weak events, of those 22 winter events, uh, winter La Ninas, 11 of them were classified as weak La Ninas. Uh, and during those weak La Ninas, we can see as far as the temperatures, again, really not much of a shift uh, away from what we would normally expect during winter or, or normal uh, temperatures. Uh, but we do see even in those uh, weak La Nina events uh, that, that they leaned a little bit drier. Um, one thing I want to show, though, um, as we go into this, you know, not all La Ninas are the same. Um, you just can't really look at that average picture and say, well, that's what's going to happen. Um, you know, of the 11 week one uh, La Ninas that did occur, uh, three of those uh, actually were, were pretty warm uh, during the winters. Um, three of them were, were about average, kind of what we're show, depicting here, and five of them actually ended up, be, ended up being cooler than normal across the area. Um, so, you know, there's really not much skill uh, in looking back as far as temperatures are concerned when, when we start looking at what could happen uh, with, uh, with La Nina's. Now, when we start looking at uh, precipitation, uh, there is a little bit of a signal there. Uh, you know, of the 11 week La Ninas that, that have occurred in the past, eight of them were drier than normal. Uh, and, so, and that is what's shown here uh, in, in that, uh, that average of the, the 11 week La Ninas we had. That's not to say we can't be, go the other way. We, two of them, uh, two of the weak La Ninas were actually wetter than normal. Uh, you can see this one in 1984-85 in, uh, uh, was, was pretty much well above normal uh, across the area. So uh, that, that's just a portion of what we look at when we start looking forward. Um, you know, you look at the climatology, you, you kind of like looking at, at uh, our averages when, when we start looking at what you would expect uh, to occur across the area. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, when we start talking about these global circulations, and so uh, El Nino, La Nina, and, La Na and, and neutral conditions, or La Nada, are, are, are they're really not the only game in town. Um, there are a, a, an alphabet soup of other uh, teleconnections, as they call them, uh, that can have an influence on, on the weather across the area. Uh, and depending on the strengths of each one, whether it's you know a strong El Nino or a weak La Nina, and how strong some of these other uh, global patterns may be, can have an impact on what the weather uh, uh, ultimately uh, does. 
Um, you know, the Climate Prediction Center um, is the one that really does a lot of the heavy lifting uh, on uh, these longer range forecasts. Uh, they do have uh, quite a uh, broad range of different long range models that they use uh, to, to forecast the whether uh, La Nina is going to continue, um, what the impacts of that are going to be. Um, one of the models or tools they use is this uh, spaghetti plot. It looks like a whole bunch of uh, you know spaghetti lines. But in general, you can see just looking at this blue line, that, that's the trend line right now. Uh, as far as all these models are concerned. And it does show that we are expecting La Nina conditions uh, to persist through winter. Uh, that's uh, played out here in this uh, probability graph uh, showing for the September, October, November, October, November, December, all the way into the December, January, February uh, time period uh, that we have pretty close to you know 70 or to 80 percent chance of that La Nina conditions continuing. Um, so that, that's why we're really looking at the, what the what La Nina can do uh, across the area as we go through the winter. Uh, the, the interesting thing though is as we get into you know late uh, winter and into early spring, there are some indications that we should be coming out or potentially be coming out of La Nina and back into a, a, a neutral uh, period as well. Um, another thing that we also look at is, is longer term statistical averages for, for individual locations. Um, sometimes these can have a little bit of a, a different look as well. Um, this is a statistical look at um, you know La Nina neutral and El Nino conditions for Springfield, Missouri uh, for the December, January, February timeframe. Uh, uh, as we we can kind of see here um, that uh, during La Nina time uh, periods, Springfield has really leaned much more towards, you know, maybe more average temperatures, more normal. Um, whereas if, if during neutral and El Nino conditions, it, it does show a little bit of a trend towards maybe a little bit cooler. Um, but the interesting thing is, is it's, uh, during La Nina or, or the different ENSO phases, you can ultimately have, uh, as we saw in the in the uh, the average plots, um, you can have years that are cooler or wetter uh, or, or warmer. Um, as far as the precipitation is concerned, um, of the three uh, patterns, uh, really La Nina, um, it does lean drier, um, but you can kind of see uh, that there's the potential there at least. Uh, that uh, you know, wetter conditions could occur, uh, but all of this is 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 what goes into uh, making that forecast uh, as as we go forward. Um, you know, and of course, all of these models, um, and I put this up in jest, uh, but all of that information goes into the models that we we produce uh, to determine what we're actually going to. Could potentially see as we go through um, you know, climate prediction center just like the weather service has their models that they use uh, to to uh, forecast out in long range terms um, some of the things that go into that is persistence you know are we in that persistent pattern like i was showing before with that northwest flow has that been a persistent pattern the climatology that we looked at you know, during weak La Ninas, we tend to be a little bit drier. That goes into the forecast. And then we also look at the, the current global expectations, going back to the, the what you would expect from La Ninas. Uh, but they also take into effect or account those other global circulations as well to make those forecasts. Um, all this information from the Climate Prediction Center, just like the the National Weather Service here is available on their website. Um, to to get an idea, uh, you know, you can you can actually go in and, and select your time period uh, right from their their homepage all the way out to the three month outlook. Uh, but if you do want to drill down a little bit farther and get a little bit more 
you know, farther out in the, in the future products or future months, uh, you just select the product on the side um, and you can see the six to 10, eight to 14 monthly maps or the seasonal maps. If you select on seasonal, you can actually go out um, as far out as a year from now. Um, their models will actually, um, you know, go out that far. Of course, the farther you go out, uh, the more error there may be in those, but at least it gives you a general idea of, of what the expectation is based on the models and the current conditions that are being put placed into those models as we go forward. So ultimately, with all of that said, what is the forecast at this point? You know, looking ahead for with the forecast, um, you know, one thing I do want to caution, though, when we start looking at these forecasts is that they're not like a weather forecast. Um, weather forecasts are what we call um, deterministic. Uh, we give you a percentage chance. Um, climate forecasts, however, are, are more uh, probabilistic. They look at the probabilities. So when you look at the map and you see areas of red or, or gray or, or, or white or, or green or blue, um, you know, they're, they're shifting those probabilities. So when I when we start looking at those maps, I like to uh, think of it as, as a pie. So, you know, you, you, you're baking a pie or somebody's baking a pie, and they're going to put three different flavors in that pie. Um, so when you have a, a forecast from the Climate Prediction Center of EC, or equal chances is what they call it, you're essentially uh, getting a forecast that, that indicates that the climate model is showing no shift in the potential uh, chance for any one outcome to occur. So there's really not a whole lot of skill in that model at that point. So in an area of EC, uh, you have an equal chance of being near normal, below normal, or above normal, whether that be you know, temperatures or precipitation. However, if you do see a forecast uh, where it's, you know, say they're, they're forecasting uh, warmer than normal conditions, what they're doing is they're shifting the amount of that pie um, towards warmer. So that way, when you cut into that pie, you have a better chance of getting that warmer slice. However, even though they're forecasting the increase in that probability, for the temperatures to be warmer or uh, precipitation be, to be wetter, you could still get the other end of the spectrum. Um, so just like any forecast, uh, there's always the possibility of having something uh, opposite. So looking at that forecast as, as we go through, uh, these, these are uh, three monthly forecasts uh, for November, through March from the Climate Prediction Center. This is their current outlook. As you can see, as far as temperatures are concerned, they are, they are shifting those probabilities, the expectation to potentially be warmer on the warmer side of things uh, from November through January, uh, December through February for a good portion of Southern Missouri, and all the, continuing all the way in that January through March period. The interesting thing though is that forecast that they are showing uh, does continue uh, for drier, potentially drier conditions uh, for that November through January period. However, when we start getting into December, February, and January, March, we are going more towards that EC forecast, that equal chances forecast. So generally what that would, uh, expectations would be, we would be leaning towards warmer weather um, and potentially drier, at least for the for the end of fall into the early winter time frame. But we could see that shift back to normal precipitation as we get towards the end of the of the winter season. Um, what does that mean for our drought? Well, um, with the with the potential for warmer temperatures and the potential for drier conditions to continue. Um, the current forecast through the end of the year uh, is for the, the drought to persist uh, or increase or develop uh, and expand across uh, portions of southwest Missouri. Probably, probably not what we want, uh, especially as, as dry as it is right now. Um, 
So a lot of that uh, information as far as the drought is concerned um, is available on our webpage. We try and keep up with this as, as quickly, as often as we can. Um, we are constantly updating uh, the, the information from, from the U.S. Drought Monitor uh, to provide that to you on our webpage through our weather stories. Um, at this point, anytime we're in uh, D2 or severe drought or greater, um, we update this weekly. Uh, so this information will be available for you. Um, you know, bottom, the bottom line uh, for uh, the end of fall and this winter, uh, the current forecast uh, does lean uh, currently slightly warmer and drier, although we do expect that potential shift back to normal precipitation or equal chances of precipitation towards the middle and end of winter. Um, you know, in past La Niña's, uh, the Jan looking at some of the, uh, the other uh, uh, statistical models and local studies, sometimes uh, La, uh, La Niña's January through April will actually start to lean slightly towards wetter. Um, but again, we're looking at past events. Um, so drought conditions, yeah, yeah, there is the expectation at this point uh, that drought will continue. Uh, and possibly expand across the area. Um, at this point, uh, that's really uh, what I have to, to provide you today. Um, you know, I would be happy to answer any questions we have at, at this time. Okay, Gene, can you hear me? I can. Okay, Gene. Uh, we did have one question come in, and that concerns Hurricane Delta. As we know, it's going across the, the Yucatan down in Mexico right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that expected to result in any subst uh, substantial precipitation that will break the drought here in the Ozarks? Well, I, I, I wish I could say yes at this point, um, but again, going back to, and I'll see if I can't get back there as, as easily as possible. Hopefully nobody gets sick as I fly through these backwards. Um, you know, one of the things that we we're seeing like, again is that, is that more common Northwest flow pattern. Uh, and with that pattern, uh, we are expecting that to rain uh, across the area here. Um, and that should, uh, as we can see, as you can see on the, the screen there, that should uh, force that track of Delta uh, to really remain uh, south and, and east of our area. Now, some of our, some of the, uh, maybe some far uh, areas, southeast portions of the Ozarks area, maybe, West Plains area uh, could potentially get some outer bands uh, from Delta, but at this point it does not look uh, like, you know, looking at the forecast models and the persistence models that we have right now, that, that that's going to have an impact on our area and have an impact on our drought. Okay, thank you, Gene. Uh, the other question that, that has kind of come in, going back to this idea of pie, um, so, from a statistical point of view, can you can you evaluate if if we're seeing a above normal chance? Does that mean that's likely going to occur? Um, if, if we're talking about the pie, um, really, it, it's not indicating that it's a better statistically. It's going to be better. Um, it just means that the, the chances of it occurring are, are greater. Um, so if we are leaning one way or another, um, let me do something real fast. Yep, and while Gene's pulling that up, I will remind everybody that you can go ahead and answer, ask your question in the uh, the question GUI on the right hand side of your screen or if you'd like you can raise your hand and we'll unmute your microphone as well okay um, so as you just kind of taking a look at what we're there 
the actual forecast is. Um, so across the area, you can see this this area of 40 to 50 here uh, across southwest Missouri for November, January temperatures. Um, what they've actually done in that pie is, is like I was showing, they've increased the chance uh, for us to be warmer uh, during that period. Now, you know, when we say warmer during that period, we're talking about a three-month period being warmer when you average those three months together. Um, that, that could mean that November could be, end up being warmer, January could end up be warmer, but December could be well below normal for the month. It's just that average period uh, is the forecast, uh, you know, what they're forecasting to be warmer. And, and this is their, the probability that they're providing us uh, with, uh, with that 40 to 50% probability of it being you know, on the warmer side. Uh, warmer than average okay okay thank you for that um so so does the i got a question here from russ nichols down in berry county does the warmer conditions translate into a possible active severe winter <laughs> well this is this is great because this actually leads right into another talk that we have scheduled about winter weather and, and severe weather during winter uh, I believe uh, that would be coming up next. Is that correct, Steve? Is that the that next talk? Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I uh, you know, we'll, you'll learn a lot more about that with the next talk in the series. Um, but uh, just in general, if you do have those warmer temperatures uh, in the fall, or if if the warmer temperatures do realize, um, you could potentially have uh some additionals or uh, some severe weather during those that time frame because of those warmer conditions um you know your your weather patterns those other uh teleconnection those other global patterns uh can have an impact uh, during these time frames and some of those uh can um you know enhance the severe weather chances or possibilities that we have across the area in shorter time scales Thank you. Okay. So at this time, that is all of the questions that we have. Uh, again, we'll, we'll uh, be glad to entertain any additional questions. Um, you can raise your hand and we can uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, and also, if you have any generalized comments, uh, also, you can uh, add your question in the chat box and we will be glad to answer it that way as well. Now, Gene did mention the um, the upcoming seminar that we will be having on October the 23rd. Uh, that is tornadoes in the fall or even the winter. Here comes the secondary severe weather season. It's a look at the cool season. Um, we all know here in the Ozarks we can get tornadoes any month of the year. And we have had several notable outbreaks during the winter months. One of the things that we really want to look at, at in that particular presentation is why are cool season tornadoes so deadly? Why is the impact so much greater than than throughout the, uh, other parts of the year? November the 3rd then, we will have a look back at flooding in the winter, most notably the deadly December 2015 flood, and also how uh, the Weather Service has uh, expanded our decision support services of today in such an event were to happen. And then lastly, we're going to we're going to wrap up the fall webinar series with a uh, winter weather products and services webinar. That's going to be on November the 5th and a repeat on November the 9th. Both of those are at one o'clock. And the title of that particular presentation is Will the Winter of 2020-2021 be remembered for snow, ice, a blizzard, or snow squalls? And that's where we're going to take another look at this updated long-range forecast, this, this 30, 60, 90-day outlook to try to give you a better updated information on what's to be expected. So, Gene, as I'm looking through the list of attendees, I do not see any additional questions, and I did not get any in the chat room. So I am going to do my, my best to try to unmute everybody and just see if there is any questions that pop in. 
And again, should you want to ask a question of uh, Gene, um, you will need to unmute your microphone as well if you have self-muted. So again, please raise your hand in the GUI and we'll be glad to answer it. Okay, Gene, any uh, last closing comments? Um, uh, well, one of the things uh, that we really want to make sure uh, is that you understand, um, you know, when we start talking about longer range forecasting, uh, you know, the, the, again, the farther out you get, uh, you know, the, the, the greater the spread of the forecast could be. But as far as using the, this forecast information for long range planning purposes, you know, this is what it's for. Um, you know, try and get a feel for, for what may happen. Um, and again, if if there's any other additional questions uh, or you want more information, uh, go to the Climate Conditions website. Uh, go to our website um, and, and look at what we've got uh, available. And again, if you have additional questions later on, there's multiple ways for you, for you to get that information, whether it's from our web page, our social media accounts, uh, or, or or just you know contacting us via email or, or via the phone. Okay, thank you. Uh, now during the, during the presentation, I did share several uh, URL links uh, to several of the sites that Gene had uh, shown you. Uh, our hope, our understanding is here, this is a pretty technical subject. And, um, you know, it's it, the, our confidence in a, the longer range is certainly less than, than what's going to happen uh, even in a couple days or even a week into the future. So um, I do invite you to go to those sites that we included throughout the course of the presentation, dig a little deeper, find out what makes sense. And if you do have any questions, you certainly can, can let us know at the National Weather Service using any of the links that you see on your screen today. And we'll be glad to provide you with a, as much information as you can to confidently respond to that long range forecast.